We're continuing our uh, examination of the first part of John's Gospel, which is sometimes called the prologue. It's the first 18 verses of John chapter 1, which actually precedes his telling of the story. He's not telling any story here in the first 18 verses. The story begins in verse 19. Verses 1 through 18 are his sort of analysis or his theological interpretation or explanation of the significance of the life of Christ rather than the events of the life of Christ. He's going to give both. He's going to give events. But he wants to, us to know what he has come to understand as the significance of the life of Christ. When he saw Jesus, he saw you know, a man who looked like an ordinary man. However, he beheld something in him which he calls his glory. He beheld his glory. That is the glory like that of the only begotten of the Father. And he says, we came to understand things about this man that you might not catch at a glance. Even if you watched all of his behavior and, and cataloged everything he said and did, you might not grasp who he really is because you might assume that he had a beginning at his birth like the rest of us have. But in fact, he is an invader from heaven. He is God come down. And this is what we're told in the first 18 verses that, uh, that precede the telling of the story of Jesus here. Now, he's in the early verses, we looked at verses 1 through 9 last time, and we have about the same number of verses to cover to the end of the prologue now. And in the first nine verses, there are certain concepts, rather rich and broad and mysterious concepts in some ways, the concept of the word, the concept of light, the concept of life, all of them being used in ways that are somewhat more spiritual, somewhat more, um, I don't know, mystical than the same words could be used in other settings. The, the word word can be a very common thing. You're listening to my words, but that's not what he means. Not, at least that's not all he means. Jesus may be, in fact, analogous to, as far as God speaking is like our speaking, but, but to him the word is something that has personality itself. I can talk about my words or I can talk about your words, but I'm not talking about something that has personality. Your word doesn't have its own personality, its own personhood. But he speaks about in the beginning was the word, and he says, in him. In who? In the word. The word is a who? The word is a he? And so he's got a, a rather strange usage of the expression word, a very common ex term, word, but not at all the common thought about it. Likewise, he says, in him was life. And we, of course, can use the word life in a very ordinary sense. It's, life is what is in living things. And uh, life is no longer in dead things. Life is just the contrast to death. But he's got something much more in mind. This life is light. And even light, obviously, is a spiritual concept here. It's not talking about the lights that come from the stars and from the sun and from candles and light bulbs. It's talking about spiritual things. He's, he's uh, introducing spiritual ideas, which, by the way, John is apparently very fond of because he, they come up a lot in his writings elsewhere also, not just this book. Uh, I mean, when you look at uh, 1 John, he says, this is the message that we have heard of him, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And you think, walk in the light. I mean, we know this expression because we live in a Christian culture that, or a culture that is shot through with Christian phraseology. Walking in the light is not a strange term for us, but when we think about it, we realize it's metaphorical. John says, and so does Jesus, that he that walks in darkness stumbles because he doesn't know where he's going. But he's not talking about literally walking through a dark room or walking through an enlightened room. He's talking, light is something else in this case. Light is truth or light is illumination or something. It's spiritual. So we've got these words that have very common meanings in other contexts, but not common here. That he's trying to get across something in popular language or well-known language that are concepts that are very hard for humans to grasp because God is hard to grasp. God is spirit. As John tells us Jesus 
said to the woman as well, John, he said, God is a spirit. And spirit is a subject that we don't know much about. Because we don't see it, we don't, it doesn't register in our senses, and we're very familiar with the world of our senses. But we're strangers to the world of spirit. At least we start out that way. We may become more acquainted with it, but the, uh, the language and analogy of spiritual things is something that John is, uh, you know, he explores and exploits and, and the words he likes to think of to explain sp these spiritual things that pertain to who Jesus is at essence. He's light, he's word, he's life, and this word was made flesh. This light was the life that enlightens everyone. All these concepts, some people may find them merely difficult, others may find them intriguing, but uh, they are definitely a different approach to the record of the story of Jesus than the Synoptic Gospels have given. And in the Sancti Gospels, it's just the historical facts. This happened, and this happened, this happened. And John wants to try to get behind the facts, get into the meaning of the life of Christ. And so that's what he's doing here. Now, I, I mentioned that in, in this prologue, there's a fairly, I believe there's a, a flow, even, even a chronological flow of thought. That is, he's moving from the creation chronologically through history up to the incarnation, I think. It's not necessary to see it that way, but I've come to see it that way in recent years. And in doing so, though, he interrupts that chronological flow with a, a couple of parentheses. And uh, one of those parentheses is verses 6 through 8, and the other is verse 15. And if the narrative is read just omitting those, and, and that's, that's what we mean by a parenthesis, that you could read it sensibly without the parenthesis there. The parenthesis is an aside that could have been left out, and it would have made perfectly good sense without it, but it's an aside that the author considers to be an important point to get straight so you don't get confused about something. And both of these parentheses in John chapter 1, the one that's in verses 6 through 8 and the one that's in verse 15, are about John the Baptist, and they are both of them calculated to diminish somewhat unrealistically high opinions of John the Baptist. Some people apparently had extremely high opinions of John the Baptist, which, by the way, he's one should. I mean, Jesus had a high opinion of John the Baptist. The problem is, when you have a high opinion of a mere man, one can come to a place of giving him uh, honor that really belongs only to God. And people do that. That's what cults do. Cults give their leaders you know, respect and honor and deference that really is at a level that really should only be reserved for God himself. And it would seem to me that John is addressing that tendency in someone that he thinks may be reading this letter. I mentioned that John was in Ephesus, writing to an audience that was probably in Ephesus, and we know that there had been a group of people in Ephesus. We, the book of Acts testifies to this in chapter 18 and 19 of Acts. There had been some people there who were acquainted with John the Baptist, not personally, but had heard about him, were disciples of his. And uh, they, apparently John's ministry had been introduced in Ephesus by a traveling preacher named Apollos who came from Alexandria while Paul was away from Ephesus and influenced a number of people. And Paul, when he revisited Ephesus, had to uh, you know, bring some adjustment because the people had come to, they were baptized in John's baptism, but they didn't know anything about Jesus' baptism. So Paul had to say, well, that John's not the final word about this. John testified of Jesus. And that's what we find John the author doing here also. He's saying, okay, there's this message from God, this word from God. This light that has been sent to people that gives life. And apparently he felt like there might be someone who's thinking he's talking about John. And among his original intended readers, there might have been some who had that, were making that mistake. So he says in verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. But this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe he was not the light. He was sent to bear witness to that light. And... Of course, the parenthesis in verse 15 has the same effect of, of, of calming down to someone who's got make, you know, putting John too much on a pedestal. And it says, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. In other words, 
Jesus has a more exalted position than John. And even once we get past the prologue and he starts talking about the story, he starts with John the Baptist and John's testimony about Jesus in contrast to John's testimony about him, his own self. And notice he says uh, in verse 20 that John confessed and did not deny, but he confessed, I'm not the Christ. So almost everything that he records from John is John diminishing himself and pointing to Christ. And, and like I said yesterday, uh, the final words that, that this gospel records from the mouth of John the Baptist are about Jesus, he must increase. And John says, I must decrease. So there seems to be, in the selection of material that the author has chosen to say about John the Baptist, uh, a deliberate um, calming of, of, uh, of perhaps an exuberance about John the Baptist that was beyond what was appropriate. But having observed those things, we see that the narration of the, of the uh, prologue continues now. At the end of uh, verse 9, we saw that Jesus was the true light. It, 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 actually, we're not calling him Jesus yet. We're still calling him the Word and the light and the life at this point. Uh, we're, we're not probably even talking about the Incarnation yet. The Incarnation is clearly mentioned in verse 14. And uh, so it's very possible that everything prior to verse 14 is prior to the Incarnation. Now, lest you just see it through that grid and not think otherwise, there is another way to see it, of course. It is possible that he's got the incarnate word in mind almost all the way through here. And it especially sometimes seems like it when you come to verse 10, and it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. We think immediately of the incarnation here. He, Jesus, was in the world. He came to his own, and they didn't receive him. And this is a good summary of Jesus' actual earthly incarnate life. But it is also a true statement about the word prior to the incarnation. God's word was in the world. God was communicating through the prophets. He was communicating through the heavens declaring the glory of God, the creation, the conscience of man. In many ways, God was trying to talk to people. He did not leave the world without a witness. He, uh, as long as... There were people, there was God's word coming to them. Not always as clearly in some cases as others. Certainly the word of God that came through Moses was not as clear as the word that came through Christ. As Paul points out in 2 Corinthians 3 when he talks about Moses' face being veiled uh, and, and thus veiling the glory of, of the covenant of, that Moses inaugurated. And then Paul goes on to say, but we are speaking with unveiled faces. And we are not like Moses and those before who spoke unclearly, he says. We speak boldly and plainly. So there are, there are degrees or a, a procession of God increasingly giving more light, speaking more plainly as history goes by. It's obvious that Adam and Eve didn't have a lot of instructions from God. Noah, after the flood, received a few more that others had not ever had. And when the law came, the Jews received more of the word of God and had more knowledge of God, more of his self-expression and, and uh, disclosure of his will than anyone had had before, apparently. But in Christ's incarnation, we have the ultimate. But I'm not sure that John's thinking that far ahead yet in verses 10 and, uh, and 11. When he says that he... You know, because he says he was in the world, we think of a man, Jesus, walking around in the world that he's talking about. Remember, he said he made everything too, and this is before the incarnation. He's, he's been personifying this word all the way through, and he continues to do so. Uh, he was in the world. God's speaking to man was always a, a phenomenon in world history. And the world was made through him, and yet the world didn't recognize him, didn't, didn't recognize his words. You know... There was a time later in the Gospel of John where this seems to be illustrated, the tendency of people to maybe have the opportunity to hear and understand God, but miss it. In, in John chapter 12, Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. And a voice from heaven spoke and said, I have glorified it and I will do it again. And the Bible says, some said it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. 
Now, John's Gospel tells us it was the voice of God that spoke to him, but some received it as a message from God, perhaps from an angel. Others just said, oh, it's just thunder. In other words, even when God is speaking, some people can discern that's a message from God. Others just say, no, it's just a natural phenomenon. Now, that's, that's why I don't accept this uh, claim that atheists sometimes make, that if God would just re reveal himself, that they believe. In, in debating atheists, sometimes I, I put the question, of what would it take for you to believe in God? And you say, well, if he just appeared before me, or if he just write, you know, in the sky, hi, I'm God. I think, no, you wouldn't. You'd just say, it's a hallucination. You'd give it a natural explanation. There's some people who, no matter how clearly God speaks, they're going to give it a natural explanation. Some will say it thunders, even if he speaks audibly from the sky. That's just thunder. You know? His voice and his word has always been in the world, but people have not been tuned into it so that they, you know, nature is crying out the glory of God, but many people are not getting the message. The world didn't hear it. The world didn't recognize it. And in verse 11, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, the word own in each of these two clauses is a different form in the Greek. The word own, the, the, the pronoun his own, in uh, the first case, is in the neuter, which means his own things, his own world, his own place, his own home, something non-personal. But the second own is... Uh, personal, it's, it's masculine, his own people. And so sometimes translators have made that clear, the New King James does not, except by uh, putting a marginal note in there about it. But he came to his own place, his own things. He came to his own world that he'd made. And his own people, which would be the Jews, did not receive him. So what we have in this, in this survey of the history of the word is that he, made the, he was in the beginning with God, he made the world, he was continuously in the world, continuously communicating, people were not hearing him, so he came especially to the Jews, his own people, even they didn't hear, they didn't receive him. Now, this again sounds like it could be a reference to Christ coming to Israel and being rejected, and a person is certainly you know, at liberty to see it that way. Uh, but we can also see it as he's talking about when the law came. God spoke to his own people in a special way through Moses, through the prophets. God's word came to the Jews continuously for 1,400 years before Jesus was born, and they weren't receptive. I mean, they were temporarily receptive when Moses gave the law, but they never really submitted. They didn't. The, the nation of Israel did not live according to God's words. They, they rejected the prophets. They killed their prophets. So that's kind of them not receiving him. And so he says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now I want to say that these two verses present the biggest challenge to the thesis I've been suggesting, that this pre-incarnation. Because if he is talking about before the incarnation, that God's word came to Israel in Old Testament times, and they were not receiving him, yet it says there was a remnant who did receive him, and he gave them the power to become the sons of God, even to be born of God. Now the reason I say this is a, a bit of a, a wrench in the works of what I've been suggesting is because in my understanding, people in the Old Testament, though they could be justified by faith, like Abraham was, I don't believe they had the experience of spiritual rebirth. I believe the experience of being born of God was a, a new privilege brought about through the New Covenant. Being born again is like having a new heart, uh, having the God's laws written on the heart, having the heart of stone taken out, the heart of flesh put in. These are all things the Old Testament predicted would happen when the Messiah comes. And... The Bible says these are done by the work of the Holy Spirit, who was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. John tells us that in John chapter 7. When Jesus says in John 7, verse 37 uh, through 39, well, Jesus speaks in John 7 through uh, 37 through 38. 
Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me, and he that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But then in John 7, 39, the explanation of the author is, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, who was not yet given, because Christ was not yet glorified. Now, rebirth is the work of the Holy Spirit. And John's gospel later tells us the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus wasn't yet glorified or resurrected. Likewise, 1 Peter chapter 1 speaks about rebirth. Not many of the epistles actually use the expression born again, but some of them do, very few. And Peter uses the expression in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1, 3, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, as we've been born again, he's begotten us again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now see, our being born again is even likened to the resurrection of Christ. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and God made us alive. He brought us to life. We've experienced a resurrection in Christ because Christ rose from the dead. Our rebirth in, in the theological writings of the New Testament is attributed to Christ's resurrection. It's our own participation in his resurrection. And therefore, being born of God seems to be a phenomenon that could not really be happening before Jesus rose from the dead. Because even we who have been born again have been through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Spirit has been given since Christ has been glorified, and that Holy Spirit given works regeneration in us so that we're born again. Now, that is my understanding reached from the verses I've just shown you. I should tell you there are people, the Reformed uh, uh, theology, for example, would not agree with them that they believe that Old Testament saints were regenerated too. And so I would stand not quite on the same set of presuppositions with them that they believe that regeneration occurred in the Old Testament to Abraham and to David and to people. And there is certainly, uh, there is some wording that might give that impression. Uh, even, even when uh, Samuel told Saul, you know, you're going to meet this company of prophets and the Spirit's going to come upon you and you'll become another man. It almost sounds like being born again. Uh, although the language is not identical and I don't think the phenomenon was identical with Saul. The things that the Bible says about rebirth in the New Testament sounds like this is one of the new phenomena of the New Covenant that was kind of brought into existence through the resurrection of Christ and the giving of the Spirit of Pentecost. So you can uh, agree or not agree with me and it won't bother me in the least, but the point is I personally still think that while people were certainly saved by faith in the Old Testament, that salvation did not include the privilege of a regenerated soul, a new life given through the Spirit. Um, though, let me just say this by way of balance to that. Maybe what is new about that is that it was wholesale throughout the people of God. When Jesus, when the Spirit was sent on the church in the upper room, perhaps the new thing is that all the Christians had it, whereas in the Old Testament only individuals like the prophets and a few others had it. It's, maybe it is conceivable that in the mind of the apostles, there was a phenomenon like this experienced by a small number of people in the Old Testament. Special people, Moses, Joshua, the Spirit of God came upon David when he was anointed. Maybe what they experienced was a regeneration, but it was not given to all of God's people. Because you might remember in Numbers, I don't mean to confuse you by thinking on my feet here and, and even modifying my own position while I speak. But I do that. I never stop correcting myself if I can. Um, in Numbers, we find that Moses was complaining to God about having the burden of leading all the people. And God said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give some of that burden to some other men. You find 70 good men and bring them to me, to the door of the tabernacle. And I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll put some, some of the spirit that's on you, on them too. And so he did. And this is the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers. And so it says, 
that in, in verse in Numbers 11:25, then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and said, He took the spirit that was upon Moses and placed the same upon the seventy elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. Now it turned out there were a couple of guys who should have been there and were elsewhere, but the spirit came on them anyway, even though they were elsewhere in the camp and uh, not under Moses' uh, oversight, and Joshua was concerned about that, and thought that Moses should tell them not to do that, not to prophesy in the camp where Moses can't sort of keep an eye on them and make sure they're not false prophets. And Joshua, in verse 28, said to, to Moses, uh, my Lord Moses, forbid them, these two men who are prophesying in the camp, but they're not there being properly supervised by the, the main prophet Moses. And Joshua thinks that might be a little bit of a dangerous situation. Maybe sort of might start a rival movement against Moses because these people too now, like him, have the spirit. Maybe they can compete with him. I think that's what Joshua is concerned about. And he says, Moses forbid them. But look at Moses' words in verse 29. Moses said to him, Are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Now see what Moses is noticing is there are some, a few, now 71, in Israel who the Lord has put his spirit upon them. Wish that would be true of all God's people. He's acknowledging that that is not the wholesale experience of all God's people, but it seems to be of a few. And it may be, although the Bible doesn't use this language, and, and therefore I'm not sure, it may be that these people had the spirit came out them, maybe they were born of God. But what was new in the New Covenant is that this is true of all God's people. That in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my handmaidens and my maid and my maidservants and my, and my servants, I'll pour out my spirit on them and they'll prophesy. In other words, the prediction of Joel chapter 2 is that this thing that Moses wished would happen to all God's people is in fact someday going to happen to all God's people. Moses said, would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets and he'd put his spirit on them. Joel said, that's what God says he's going to do in the last days. He's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And they'll all prophesy. The very thing that a few people did here, be done by one. And, and Joel is certainly prophesying about the new covenant because that's what Peter told us on, in Acts chapter 2. When the spirit came, he said, this is that which Joel spoke about. So in a sense, it may well be that the phenomenon of being born again was not entirely withheld from humanity prior to the resurrection of Christ, but that God selectively, on occasion, when he selected a leader or a prophet, would actually cause that person, we know that he put his spirit upon them, but whether that was the same thing as being born again back then, I don't know. I, that's that's going to have to remain something that I'm, it's just speculation as far as I'm concerned. But I'm saying that that might modify what I was saying about Rebirth didn't happen in the Old Testament. Maybe with a few people it might have. But what I'm saying is when we look at John chapter 1 and these words about to as many as received him, John 1, 12, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God who were born of God. If, I, if my thesis is correct that this is still prior to the incarnation because it's not till verse 14 it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's that would be the next step in the survey of history, of the Word. Then it would seem like it is saying in verse 12 and 13 that even before the Incarnation, there was a remnant. His own people, the Jews, in general did not receive him, but a few did. And to those who did, to as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. And it may be that he is talking about actual experience of being born of God with a few in the Old Testament. I'm not sure. There is another way of seeing it that there's some manuscript evidence for, but it's a not, not one of the more important manuscripts. A few manuscripts of the New Testament read verse 13 a little differently than what we have it here. Because here we read, who were born. Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But there's a few manuscripts that say, who was born. Singular. And see, it might be a reference to the incarnation at this point. 
of Jesus, saying that as many as who believe on his name, he who was born, not of blood, nor of the will of man, but he who was born of God, meaning Jesus. So the way it stands in most manuscripts with the who were born, plural, sounds like it's talking about the believers were born. But if the manuscripts that read who was born really are retaining the original reading, it's not a reference to the believers being born of God, but to him on whose name they believe. He was the one who was born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the very next statement is the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it would not be unnatural for John in verse 13 to be talking about the birth of Jesus, but the trouble is that the more important manuscripts don't read that way. This is one of those things, when you study the Bible, you find out there's more options than you wish there were. You know, there's, there's more alternative readings than you would like. You just would prefer, why don't you just tell me one possibility and no more, so I don't have to think about it, you know? But, uh, you know, if you're in any other professional field secularly, you'd be willing to give it your best thought if it mattered to you. There's nothing more important than the queen of science's theology that would warrant our giving it our best intellectual efforts. Uh, sometimes we just don't want that. We don't mind putting our great efforts in learning engineering if that's our field, or law if we're lawyers, or, or medicine if we're doctors, or whatever else. Professionals always put a, put a great deal of uh, intellectual energy into analyzing and sorting out and solving the problems with their particular field of expertise. But we don't want to have to do that with God. We don't want to do that with theology. We want the preacher just tell me what it says and don't make me think about it. That's where I'm a little different. I've, I've always wanted to have to think. I don't want the preacher to tell me what it means. I want to know what the options are. I want to think about it. I, even if I don't know what the answer is. Even if I never figure it out. I'd rather have had the pleasure of thinking about it myself rather than following what someone else decided was the right answer. And that's a lot of fun to me, but not everyone seems to enjoy it. So I'm just telling you, I don't know. I don't know if this is this verse 13 is talking about the people who believed in the word were born again, or if it's talking about the word himself was born of God, not of blood, not of the will of man, or the will of the flesh. So that simply isn't a, a, an option that exists because of a variant in the manuscripts. There's more than one manuscript that, that, possibility. Now I want to say something about verse 12 anyway, and that is, uh, <clears throat> even though I believe it is a reference to people receiving God's word before Jesus was incarnate, we do know that people were called the children of God in the Old Testament. That doesn't mean they experience rebirth as we do, because there's a lot of ways the term sons of God can can, can be used. Jesus is obviously called the Son of God in one sense, different than we are. We're called sons of God or children of God, but not in the same sense that Jesus is a son of God. Uh, angels might even be called sons of God. In the book of Job, there's, there's reference to sons of God in a context that sounds like it's probably talking about angels, so that's disputed too, disputable. And in, in Hosea, Israel is said to be, uh, you know, destined to be God's sons when they're uh, loyal to him. Even Israel as a whole is seen collectively as God's firstborn son. So when we talk about being sons of God, it's not always the same thing. It depends on the context and who we're talking about and so forth. So it's not, it's not necessary to assume that if we say godly people in the Old Testament who received God's word and responded in faith, they were called sons of God. It doesn't necessarily tell us that they experienced rebirth as we have and are sons of God or children of God who have been born again into God's family because the term son is used a variety of ways. But this verse is the closest verse we have, I think, in the Bible to using a term like we commonly use when we talk about people coming to Christ We talk about accepting Jesus. It's a very common thing when we evangelize people to tell them what you need to do to, to get saved is to accept Jesus into your heart. Now that, in fact, could be a, a reasonable way of describing what really has to happen. But many of us don't realize that expression is never really found in the Bible. No place in the Bible ever instructs anyone to receive or accept Jesus into their heart. 
And when we do talk about that, when we use that kind of language, I don't know if people really have a clear idea of what we're asking them to do or not. Uh, if I said to somebody who I was hoping to win over their affection, you know, let me into your heart, they might understand that that just meant I want you to, you know, break, you know, remove the barriers to accepting and loving me. You know, to, don't don't block me out <clears throat> of your life. But when we say accept Jesus into your heart, especially when we say maybe to children, uh, I don't know what they picture. I, I think they picture a little Jesus coming and living inside their heart. In fact, sometimes we even encourage that idea. With little children, sometimes Christian parents want to show their Christian friends that their kids have their are saved. We say to their little child, where's Jesus? And the right answer is supposed to be, they're supposed to point in here. You know, he's in here. Well, technically, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says he's at the right hand of God. And he's going to stay there until he comes back. <laughs> but there's a sense in which he's in here. I mean, the spirit of Christ is in me. And in that sense, Christ is in me. So depending on what is meant by the words, they're not objectionable. To say you need to accept Jesus into your heart is not an objectionable thing if depending on how you're understanding it. What it really means in this case is he doesn't say as many as accepted Jesus into their heart, but as many as received him in the sense that most people did not. He came to his own requesting their loyalty, requesting their submission, re presenting himself to them as their king and as their ruler. And mostly they didn't accept him in that role. They didn't accept the word as the ruler of their life. Some did, though. They received that word. They were not resistant to the word of God. They didn't reject, but they received. I don't, you know, when we hear this verse, this is such a great evangelistic verse, you know, as many as you received him, and, we, and then we tell people, you need to receive Jesus into your heart. As I said, that is true, depending on how you understand it, but I, I just wonder. I, I just know I was raised in evangelical hearing that terminology, and I never really quite understood what that was calling me to do. I thought it meant say a sinner's prayer and ask Jesus to come into my heart. But receiving him doesn't mean you ask him to come into your heart. It means you open your heart to God and, be, and you're receptive to him completely rather than resisting him. And in this case, of course, in the case of Jesus, we receive him as our Lord, which is what he presents himself and offers himself as. It doesn't mean we ask him to step from this spot outside my heart into a spot inside my heart, spatially. It means my heart is surrendered to him rather than rebelling against him. Rather than rejecting his claim upon my life, I'm receiving it as valid. I'm, I'm receiving him as who he says he is rather than resisting and rejecting that. That's certainly when he came to his own and they didn't receive him, but some did. Whether this is talking about Jesus in his incarnation, presenting himself to the Jews as their Messiah, or whether it's simply referring to God trying to approach them again and again through the prophets and trying to get them to receive his word and to govern themselves under his words. In any case, it's a matter of a stance that one takes, hardening their heart against or softening their heart to be compliant with him. This is, this is the idea rather than asking a little man to step inside and live in this house in, in my chest, this blood pump under my fifth rib. Now, a privilege was given to those who were receptive to him to be included in God's reckoning as his children. Now, we read of the incarnation unambiguously in verse 14. I said the incarnation might be in view earlier, but I'm thinking not, but I could be wrong. Maybe it is. But it certainly is. There's no question about verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Now, these words, as I mentioned briefly yesterday, I didn't say much briefly yesterday, but this I said briefly yesterday, because I'm going to say it less briefly tonight. Um... <coughs> The language of the first part of this verse is, I think, deliberately reminiscent of God's dwelling among Israel in the tabernacle. Because although our translation says the word dwelt among us, the word dwelt in the Greek is the word for pitching a tent or a tabernacle, living in a tabernacle. 
And so it literally says the word became flesh, and this flesh became a tabernacle in which he dwelt among us, as God dwelt in a tabernacle in the Old Testament among his people. God visited and, and uh, lived with them. So did the word in another kind of tabernacle, a human body, a human being named Jesus. And when he says, we beheld his glory, it continues the, the connection. Because it was there at the tabernacle that the Shekinah glory resided. When you come to the tabernacle to worship God, there were three sections. The open courtyard was just open to the light of the sun and natural light. And you'd offer your sacrifice at the brazen altar, then the priest would go and wash himself at the brazen labor of cleansing, and then he'd go inside the building. But the building had two parts. The first part, twice the size of the second. And the first part was called the holy place. He'd go in there and there was the golden lampstand and there was the golden incense altar and there was the table of showbread. And the priest would go in there and he'd burn incense and so forth. There was no light from the sun in there because there were no windows in the building. The light of that place was from the seven lamps of the golden lampstand. But once a year, the high priest would go beyond that, beyond a second veil, into the cubicle called the Holy of Holies. There, there was no natural light at all, nor was there any lamp. There was no artificial light or natural light there. So what was he doing, groping around in the dark? You'd think the ends of the cherubim wings might poke him in the eye or something if he's <laughs> moving around blindly. But actually, the assumption was there's plenty of light in there. There's no windows, and there's no lamps, but the glory of the Lord resided there. Nothing illuminated the Holy of Holies except God's own glory. That's where he lived. That's where he lived among his people. That's where he met with his high priest. By the way, in Revelation chapter 21, where there's the description of the New Jerusalem, is described in terms intentionally reminiscent of the Holy of Holies. The New Jerusalem is a cube shape. The Holy of Holies was seven, it was, was 15 feet wide, 15 feet deep, and 15 feet tall. It's a cube, 15 feet. The city of the New Jerusalem is described as being 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles cube. It's a big, big cube. And we're told about the uh, Holy of Holies, I mean, about the uh, New Jerusalem in Revelation 21. It says, there was no light of the sun and no light of the moon shining there. It's not necessary. The glory of the Lord and the, the glory of the Lamb was the light of it. Just like the Holy of Holies. There's no natural light there. Didn't need it. The glory of God illuminated the Holy of Holies. So also the New Jerusalem is illuminated without natural light, but only by the glory of the Lord. It's like a big cube, a big, a big Holy of Holies. Really, that's the deliberate imagery of, that the city of God is to the people of God what the Holy of Holies was to one man, a high priest who could go in once a year. No, we live all the time in the privilege of the immediate presence of the glory of God. And John said, you know, we saw that glory in another tabernacle, a man. The Word who was God became flesh. He took on human nature, not just human body. Jesus took on human nature as well. Now, not, I don't mean sinfulness. I mean human limitations. And this is something that we have to understand. Becoming flesh meant becoming human, becoming mortal. All flesh is as grass. Uh, Jesus said, unless those are short, no flesh would survive. Flesh is mortal man. And the word became mortal, became man. And in so doing, became greatly reduced it was a great humbling of himself to become a human being. At least that's how Paul describes it in Philippians chapter 2. Because there, he reminds us that Christ, prior to his incarnation, existed in the form of God. Entirely agreeable with John's doctrine that, John, that Jesus was God before. And then he became a man. So also in Philippians 2, we have this reference to Jesus in verse 6 as having been in, originally in the form of God. But in verse 7, it says he made himself of no reputation. That is a strange translation, the New King James. 
slavishly follows the King James in this. It really should say he emptied himself. The word kenosis in the Greek means emptied. The King James translators, being, I guess, more poetic, wanted to expand it out to a lot of words and said, he made himself of no reputation. That whole phrase, simply in Greek, is he emptied himself. The New King James sometimes follows the King James a little closer than it, than it probably should have, but that's the whole idea of the New King James is not to change the King James much, just to modernize the language. But occasionally we need to be aware that the King James had its flaws in the way it was translated. Any modern translation will say he emptied himself, because that's what the Greek says. Jesus existed in the form of God, but in becoming him, he emptied himself. Of what? Of his prestige, of his divine privileges, and he took on himself instead of the form of God, the form of a servant. And then he goes on to say he humbled himself even further to suffer death of the cross, which is the most humiliating of all deaths that a person could have died in that situation. And so he, he came from the highest place of honor and glory and came to the lowest place of disgrace and humility. This is the mind that was in Christ we're told to emulate. He begins this section by saying, let this mind or this mentality be in you that was in Christ. Be humble like that. Now, but the point is, Paul is saying that in, in the process of becoming man, this required God, God the Word, God Christ, to empty himself of a lot of stuff. You can't fit God into such a small container and, ha and, and not leave something out. Now, you kind of could in some respects, but, but God is one of the things about God's nature is he's uncontained. Solomon, when he dedicated the temple, is praising God, who am I to build a house for you? Heaven, even the heavens can't contain you. What house am I to build for you to live in? Solomon knew that you can't really contain God in a even in a house, much less in a smaller container, a human body. But if you trim off some of the, the large parts of God, his, his essence could possibly be presented, uh, could he represent himself in a scaled down version. Now what does scaled down mean? When Jesus became man, in what way did God scale <laughs> himself down? And just so people don't think, uh, that I'm saying something that I'm not, because I'm not. I'm not saying something I'm not. 